When I think about personal leadership, I think that really has very little to do with your level. And it's really about being true to living with your values, living with integrity, leading your life and not sort of just floating along. Hello and welcome to The Daily Helping with Dr. Richard Schuster. Food for the brain, knowledge from the experts, tools to win at life. I'm your host, Dr. Richard. Whoever you are, wherever you're from, and whatever you do, this is the show that is going to help you become the best version of yourself. Each episode, you will hear from some of the most amazing, talented, and successful people on the planet who followed their passions and strive to help others. Join our movement to get a million people each day to commit acts of kindness for others. Together, we're going to make the world a better place. Are you ready? Because it's time for your daily helping. Welcome to The Daily Helping with Dr. Richard Schuster. I'm your host, Dr. Richard, and today's guest is Allie Polin, a former senior executive with deep experience in leadership, change management, and organization development. Now a writer, coach, and speaker, she is driven to help people create a full life and achieve professional success. Her award-winning blog, Break the Frame, draws on leadership lessons from daily life as a catalyst for breakthrough change and inspires people to engage more purposefully at the intersection of life and leadership. She is the co-author of a book available on Amazon, Energize Your Leadership. This book shares 16 stories and pathways to help people discover new ways to get energized, ignite energy in others, and in their workplace to break through and create a dynamic future. In 2015, Allie was recognized as one of Inc. Magazine's 100 Great Leadership Speakers. Allie, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Dr. Richard. I'm really happy to be here. Well, I am thrilled that you're on. And I wanted to start out because I'm just very curious. I I know that you are American-born and worked quite a bit in Washington, D.C., but now you're in Australia, kind of away from everything. So how did you wind up in Australia? What happened there? (laughs) Well, we, we always sort of, my husband and I were always intrigued at the idea of living overseas. And when a job opportunity came up actually for my husband, it was in Australia, not where we would have necessarily chosen to move in Australia. I live in the outback with all the kangaroos and dingoes and all the other wildlife and spiders. (laughs) But we decided why not? Our children at the time were little, and we decided to just make the leap and embrace the adventure. And here we are five years later, still living here. And we, we expected initially to be here only two years. So, still, still with the dingoes, the kangaroos, and the spiders. Yes. I could do without the spiders, but yes. <laughs> I think I saw something online, at one, and I don't, I don't know if there's any truth to this, but that of all of the places in the world... Australia has the greatest concentration of animals and insects that could kill you with a stinger bite. Yes, yes. And I've heard that, well, not only have I heard it, I believe that it's true, but they handle it very well. My children will come home from school and say, oh, there was a a brown snake today in the recess field. So they brought us all into the classroom and the snake man came and took it. Meanwhile, if one of the children had been bitten, it would have been devastating. It's so poisonous. Um, but they, they're very calm and cool and collected about it. So it's, it's a really different place to be than uh, Washington, D.C. Yeah, I, I imagine I, I can't envision a, a school in Washington, D.C. employing a snake man. No. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> very good. So you're in Australia and you are running the award-winning blog, Break the Frame. But I want to jump back and go into the past a bit and talk about you know, what really was the catalyst for you in getting you involved in leadership. Well, a couple things. So one was when I first started working out of uh, undergrad, I worked for a major consulting firm in their change management practice. And it was really focused on the people side of change, usually technology change, but not always. could be organizational or process or whatever change. I started to see that one of the biggest factors in the success of the change program certainly was 
leadership. And it wasn't only the senior leaders, but the people throughout the chain who were leading and responsible for others. But even more importantly, sort of that personal leadership component, the decision to choose to change. So I started to sort of observe that and see that and and build on that through my change management work. And over time, got increasingly uh, interested not only organizational change, but individual change from a from a personal leadership standpoint and and pursued coaching certifications and and other things to sort of diversify my practice and perspective. And then what happened next? Well, I took a position utilizing my coaching. <laughs> and then uh, we got purchased by a little company, which had an amazing culture, where I was doing great leadership development work and organizational development work. I got purchased and I took a position as vice president of um, people and innovation for a big company. Saw again the difference that leadership makes on a culture and on the individual. And it was at the end of my time there that I decided that I was going to break with my organizational life that I'd worked in from 1999 until, not 1999, 1993 until 2011 when I'd been in organizations and start my own practice to help individuals sort of unleash the leader within themselves. And in 2011, took what was really a side practice and created um, my business, Break the Frame. Outstanding. So you mentioned helping individuals, you know, you're talking about personal leadership. So what are the big distinctions that you've experienced between personal leadership and organizational leadership? Organizational leadership is really typically based on hierarchy, right? You know who the leader is in the division. Maybe it's a manager, maybe it's a director, maybe it's a SVP or CEO or whatever. They have responsibility and accountability based on position. It's positional. When I think about personal leadership, I think that really has very little to do with your level. And it's really about being true to living with your values, living with integrity, leading your life and not sort of just floating along. As you know, it happens to all of us at some time or another. We sort of just go with the 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 flow of of the water as opposed to sort of standing up and saying, "All right, which way do I want to go? Do I want to go back to the shore? Do I want to go out further? Do I continue to to go along the path that I'm on?" And I think that's sort of the heart of personal leadership. So how does one develop their personal leadership skills? I break it often down into three pieces, which is confidence, competence, and creativity. And I know that those aren't unique words to me in my business, but I'll tell you what I think each of them means. I think it's the confidence to speak up and stand up for what you believe in. And and that can be really scary, whether it's with a personal relationship that you need to speak up or an organizational setting that you need to speak up. But to take a stand for yourself and for others, it's not only speaking up for yourself or only speaking up for others. I think competence is really continuing to grow yourself and invest in yourself and knowing yourself. Maybe it's reading books or blogs or taking a class, whether it's on Coursera or with a local university, but continuing to grow who you are. And then creativity, I think, is really about stretching yourself and challenging yourself to get out of the rut of daily life and to sort of bring a spark of change and something a little bit more creative and sort of living that way more intentionally. One of the things I imagine that you hear often from people uh, is they probably say something along the lines of, oh, I'm not very creative. Mm -hmm. What do you say to that person? I I would say, and I do say, that being creative is not like being an author or an artist or a designer. Being creative is finding new challenges and new pathways from the old. So on a really simple level, I encourage people, if they drive to work down the same roads every day and stop at the same Starbucks every day and, you know, park in the same spot in the parking lot every day, a little 
change can spark creativity. Maybe that's driving a new way. Maybe it's not stopping at the Starbucks, but stopping somewhere entirely new for coffee. It's it's little shifts that sort of bring a freshness to their experience that I think opens up some of those creative pathways. And probably builds some of that confidence you spoke of in your first C. Yeah. yeah. Your first of your C3, your three Cs. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And, you know, as you're describing this to me, Allie, what I'm hearing is that your take on personal leadership isn't necessarily bound to the workplace. I would strongly, strongly agree with that. In my practice now, my practice sort of grew out of my organizational work, but I work with, you know, stay-at-home mothers and small business owners and, and executives, all of whom have their own unique circumstances, but they all relate to sort of personal leadership. We're all leaders, right, of our lives. We're all theoretically able to take control and make decisions for ourselves and make choices, and that's not based on where we were. It's really interesting the way that you frame that because essentially your point's exactly right. You know, we we get up, we choose to go to work if we work. We choose to go to Starbucks and order what we order. But we don't think about that as you know, a leadership role. Like, you know, people don't view their lives from the standpoint of I'm the CEO of me, but maybe we should. For me and my experience in my own life and what I've seen with my clients and friends and colleagues, I think the more we take responsibility and feel empowered to make those choices, sort of the happier and more joyful we can be. I mean, even even recently, so we're living here in Australia and our housing situation is changing. And for a while, I was incredibly upset that our housing situation was changing and I was angry and I was frustrated. And I said, maybe we should leave. This is so difficult. Until I decided to acknowledge that if we choose to be here, yes, it's more difficult and yes, it's more challenging and yes, it's a pain. But if this is where we want to be, then it's a choice. You accept some of those circumstances in a very different way when you choose to say, but this is what I want despite the hardships. And that seems to tie into a a phrase you made at the very beginning, choose to change. Absolutely. Now, we, we talked a little bit about personal leadership. We talked about personal leadership. What about everyday leadership? So it really, to me, is really connected to personal leadership. So everyday leadership, again, goes back to the idea and my strongly held belief that leadership doesn't only belong in a boardroom. So everyday leadership shows up in ways big and little, right? Everyday leadership is when you see somebody who trips in the street, you don't say, wow, look at that person who fell in the street. (laughs) Keep going. You stop. You say, are you okay? Do you need anything? Or it could be, you know, that parent at your child's school who clearly is new and they're not really sure how it's going and you walk up to them and say, I don't recognize you, I want to introduce myself. If you have any questions, let me know. It's making somebody not feel as alone. All those small acts of kindness, of generosity, of noticing someone else's humanity is really everyday leadership. What it sounds like is the way you're describing everyday leadership is social and moral responsibility. That is a huge component of it. And I'll tell you how I taught it. So recently I went into a local primary school here and I worked with their student leaders. And what I told them, I thought it was, and I asked them, what do you think it is? What do you think this everyday leadership thing is? And they said it is not always having the right idea. So in their case, it was, we think we should have kickball on Fridays, you know. But if everyone in the school says, we really want to have a game of dodgeball, then you need to be open to that and be open to changing your mind and being open to hearing what other people want and need. That's an act of everyday leadership. It's a really small thing, but it's truly leadership to not be fixated on your solution, but to create a solution that's going to work for many 
And that's a that's a little thing at school, right? Or that very same day at the school, I saw a parent who decided to, instead of walking the front gate, go over the fence. And instead of helping their child over the fence, who was clearly struggling, they let their child climb the fence until they asked for help. That's everyday leadership because it's taking a step back, letting someone else learn and struggle and helping when they need you and not only when you see them struggling. So it's all, again, all those small acts that every day we all have an opportunity to sort of stretch and use our leadership skills. And and certainly with, with the last lesson in particular, empowering for that child. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, it, it's funny that you're using a dodgeball analogy, but it's very much translatable to real world situations where, you know, I mean, how many times you know, ha- has an individual, I'm sure, encountered, you know, a coworker, a boss who isn't taking into consideration the needs of the organization or even, even in a different capacity, you know, on a smaller scale. So, that's very interesting. Do you do a lot of speaking to children? I don't do a lot. I've done some recently, <laughs> but I but I don't do a lot. But I also want to just reflect back that I I agree with you that I think that that same concept really holds true in the organization. I've seen lots of organizations where, say, operations is charged with cost cutting and saving cost for the organization, and the um, consulting division is responsible for achieving a mission, right? This is our mission. We need to go and do it. And sometimes they're at odds. And so instead of being at odds, how can the leaders of those organizations, instead of you know throwing balls at each other, how can the leaders of those organizations seek to hear each other and change their approaches to create something that's going to be workable for both parties? One of the things that often happens, as you know, is that sometimes it takes a tremendous failure before an organization or an individual is willing to look back and and make change. Mm -hmm. What would you say to somebody who's, who's in that position, who historically has not really listened to the fact that everybody wants to play dodgeball? What do you say to that guy who you know, is in this position, how he can help his organization, how he can make that change in a better way. So when I've helped organizations create change and implement change programs, so typically what I'll see when a, when a change program is initiated, it comes from the top and there's lots of announcements and there's sometimes there's even lots of meetings, right? Hey guys, we're coming to you and we're talking to you about this great change. And they hear and they sense the unrest and they push the change, and they push the change because they know what's best. So one of the first things the executives that, that I've counseled need to do is go on a listening tour, right? It's not a solutions tour where you're pushing your solution. You're literally there to listen. You're there to understand. You're there to hear the challenges but also hear the ideas and perspectives of others. Because when you go on a solutions tour, you're ready to defend your solution. When you go on a listening tour, it, it, it creates a totally different mindset because you're not making promises, but you're, you're seeking to understand. So that's the number one thing I would say to do. Then what also needs to be done, in my opinion, is when you're creating these changes and solutions, then don't go back to your office with your other peers and heck, I know I've been in these meetings. I've been a vice president. I've been in those closed door meetings where all the VPs and the SVPs brainstorming, what do we need to do next? There's something to be said for including those people who are impacted in those discussions. Instead of assuming that you know best, again, even after you're listening, I think invite in representatives or let groups of people get together and then bring that representative in so you can have other people as a part of the solution, as opposed to pushing down, I think there's something to be said for pulling together. Absolutely. And I couldn't help but think as you're working your way through these examples, how much of this is translatable to relationships between spouses, between parents and child, 
seems like a lot of this really would be translatable. Yes, it is because I am far from a perfect parent, but it, it's incredible what happens when I think I know what's happening and when I ask what's happening, that I'm not always so right and my anger and frustration and my perception is holding us back <laughs> as opposed to you know, yelling at someone, do this and do it now, doesn't create the long-term change that you want. Maybe it gets, you know, socks up off the floor, but it's, but it's not going to get socks up off the floor next time. And it's not going to foster a closer relationship between you and whomever it is you're, you know, having your disagreement with. And, you know, uh, along the same lines, one of the things that I know is a personal passion of yours is fostering leadership in children. And I'd love for you to talk about that a bit. Yeah. So what a lot of my work is based on, particularly in recent years, is observing real life and extrapolating the leadership lesson. So I'll tell you a quick story. So my uh, family and I went on a hike out here in the outback. And my son was leading the charge. And at the time, he was probably, I don't know, nine And he was going ahead of us. And I'd say, wait, stop. And he'd say, I'm leading you. (laughs) And I said, honey, if, if you're not leading us, if we can't see you. And he stopped. And we talked about that later in our drive home. What does it mean to, if you're gonna lead someone or you're leading, that someone needs to see what you're doing? And again, that lesson applies to people at work people at home. And it really applies to children because the younger we start to talk about these lessons, the more they grow into people who understand them. They really aren't just sort of getting hit with them over the head when they're, you know, 40 and running a division, but they're eight years old remembering that hike. And if I can't see you, you're not leading me and bring that up through everything they do growing up. So I think these lessons that we're worried are going to be too complex for our children, we just need to find a way to relate it to where they are and what they're doing. And they can hold on to those lessons throughout their, you know, their growing up in adulthood. Based on your experience and your research that you've done, what's the right age for parents to start teaching leadership skills to their kids? I think it can be super young. I genuinely do. So again, it goes back to how we define leadership. Um, A book that my child loved when she was super young, I'll say she was five, maybe even younger, was a book called The Paper Bag Princess. And The Paper Bag Princess was about a princess who, in the end, didn't need a prince to save her. And she had what she needed within her to go be brave, be strong, and lead. Now, even reading that book with your child and saying, hey, what'd you think of that book? What did you think of the paper bag princess? Even those tiny conversations with little kids starts them thinking about who they are, about where they fit, and about leadership. Not in a complex way that we're going to understand that, hey, guys, I'm teaching you about leadership. But I think it's opening the doors to those conversations and bringing in those books and bringing in those opportunities. It, there's really not, I mean, you're not going to, you know, start your nine month old thinking about leadership, but there really isn't an age that's too young to do something, in my opinion. I think that's terrific. And, and I know that you have a book that you've co authored uh, called The Parent's Guide to Leadership. And I would love for you to talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So, The Parent's Guide to Leadership really shares a couple of things. It shares from myself and my co author, Karen Hurt, we both shared stories and the lessons that um, those stories taught us. So it about how we would, what we taught us about being leaders and what we then taught our children about being leaders. In the book, there's also activities, there's book recommendations, there's conversation starters, there's some coloring pages that they can fill in and sort of fill in some bubbles about what they're thinking about leadership. And so we really tried to give parents different ways at different points to 
engage on the topic of leadership with their children, but also see these small moments as opportunities by sharing sort of our stories and our small moments. I think it helps other parents see that, oh, wow, that that thing that just happened is really an opportunity. That's a, a door open for me to sort of talk about who my child is becoming and not just what happened. And so that was really the... Um, the idea behind the book as well. And you mentioned the book is a collection of stories, among other things. Do you have a favorite story from that book? You know, one of the things that stands out to me from that book, actually, and we both shared (laughs) one from each of our children, is um, we actually asked our children to uh, write a piece for us. It was actually an interview piece where we asked them to define leadership. Because I think we think about leadership in certain terms as adults, and rarely are we asking our seven, eight, nine, ten 10-year-old, what's a leader? What's a leader do? How do you show up as a leader? What do you think about leaders? And asking them these questions and by sharing their answers, I think, number one, it gives parents questions to ask. And number two, I think it gives us insight into... While the words don't match ours, the level of sophisticated perception that our children have about the people in their lives and what people are doing and what opportunities they have to lead. So I love both of the pieces that Karen and I shared from our own children and not just from us, sharing our children's view on leadership. That's really, really fantastic. And we will we will have the link to that book in the show notes and on the app so people will be able to get their hands on that, most certainly. And what I'd like to do is shift gears a little bit because what you're most well-known for lately is your award-winning blog, Break the Frame. So talk a little bit about how you started that and what people can find on Break the Frame. So I started with a major consulting firm out of college And uh, in college, I had long flowing hair. And by the time I had my first day of work, I cut it into a very work-appropriate bob. I took out all of my extra earrings (laughs) that I had that I had acquired during college. And I wore two very appropriate studs. I wore my blue suit. And I learned how to speak in a way that was using the right lingo. And I threw myself into this life, this working life, And at some point, I got lost in the mix. The Allie that was in college got lost. And I went from being Allie in college and Allie growing up to Allison. And I was Allison the professional. And everyone knew Allison the professional. And I looked at my friends and I looked at the people I had known and my colleagues. And I think a lot of people got lost in the process of becoming something in becoming a successful professional. And so I created Break the Frame to really help people break with the idea that this is all being a professional is. That you still need to choose a full life. You still need to choose happiness. You still can do all these other things to make sure that while you're on the quest for success, that you're still living a life that you're going to look back and feel was a success instead of just given in service of pursuit of, you know, some professional designation or title or whatever. That resonates so strongly with me. And, and I can personally relate to that as well. I, I, I graduated from college, was fairly carefree, and then, you know, joined the world like so many others do, you know, with the, the idea that, you know, one day we're going to climb that ladder and and be in the top, and uh, was not happy doing it, as you know. So, you know, that that really speaks strongly to me, the way that you just described that. So give some examples of some of the materials, some of the guests you've had on, some of the other things in Break the Frame along those lines that people can take to enrich themselves and, you know, shift that mindset. Well, I'll tell you one of my favorite pieces, and I don't know how other people <laughs> view this piece, but... Uh, There's a lot being said about, you know, life begins at the end of your comfort zone. Get out of the status quo. The status quo is nasty and disgusting and horrible. And, and, you know, you'll never amount to anything if you just live the life in your comfort zone. 
And you hear a lot of that online, in blogs, in books. So what I believe is the comfort zone isn't your enemy. So I wrote a piece about that. The comfort zone is a place for when you do stretch, go back. Go back to your comfort zone because it's a chance for you to recharge and reflect. You don't need to constantly push yourself into discomfort in all areas of your life at all times. The more you push yourself, your comfort zone is actually shifting little by little with you, even if you don't notice it at first. But to really recognize that your comfort zone is there to serve you and not only tie you down and to not always believe the hype that it's a bad thing and a bad place for us. It's actually, if you think about it, almost like a trampoline, right? If you start with your comfort zone, and you start to bounce higher and higher and higher, it's your starting foundation. And that starting foundation is what's going to allow you to sort of get that lift and get that air. But you have to have something underneath you to start. So while I'm a big fan of breaking the frame and making the leap and all these other things, I think one of the things I try to remind people is that life doesn't have to be a free fall. You don't have to constantly feel off balance to be moving forward. I love that analogy. It's so simple, but it's it's right on. You know, you you often to your point, you know, you hear people in the media, you know, go into your office, burn the bridges, take the leap. That might not always be the best advice given one's life circumstances. Right. And I'm I'm a big fan of that. Like I I write about that too. I write about how to do what you're afraid to do and I give people tactical ways to do it. But I think at the same time, I try to support them to help them know that while you're doing all these things, you know, make sure you're taking care of yourself along the way. Right. So what are some of those tactics, Allie, to (laughs) to help people overcome those fears? Well, in one of my pieces that I wrote, and I think I wrote it last year, (laughs) you know, letting go of that fear of regret. I think We're always so reluctant to change because we're worried we're going to make the wrong choice. And then sometimes we tell ourselves, well, whatever's meant to be is meant to be, as if that's soothing ourselves that, well, if I made the wrong choice, then, you know, that's okay, right? Because I'm meant to be where I am. So what I try to help people do, and I give them tactical things to do, is to actually shift their perspective around that choice. So if you think that one choice is right and one choice is wrong, you are forever going to be stuck in the middle of those two choices, right? Because, oh my goodness, what if I pick the wrong thing? So a really simple thing to do, and it's more of a, a mental exercise, is you can envision yourself like on a tennis court, for example, right? And the right-hand side of the choice is the fear of regret, and the left-hand side of the court is where you just can't go wrong. There's nothing that can go wrong. And you are standing firmly in that fear of regret side of the court. Literally, I tell people, stand up, (laughs) stand up, and move to the other side of your room that you're standing in. If you're in your office, just get up and walk to the window. Imagine in your mind's eye that you're walking to the other side of the court where things can't go wrong. And sometimes, often, just that physical movement helps you actually make the mental shift where it opens up the choice in a whole new way. Because it's not fear of regret or it's going to be wrong. It can't go wrong. So if things can't go wrong, the choice is very different, right? Because then you're just comparing this choice to that choice, not a right choice to a wrong choice. We, look, we call that in psychology, we would, we would look at that as reframing. Essentially, you're taking a negative situation and you're putting a more positive spin on it, and then it's not quite so scary. So that's, that's a technique that uh, you're using. I, I think you probably were a psychologist in a past life or something. I, I, was, a, exactly. I was a psych minor in college. <laughs> okay, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Uh, that, that's exactly one of the techniques that we would utilize in a therapeutic setting to help people 
situations a lot like you described that I've never heard the tennis court analogy before. That's fantastic. But uh, in essence, yes, that you know, so many people are paralyzed by fear. And if you take a situation and show them a different way of looking at it to where it's not so scary, then all of a the sudden they're more enabled to act, which is what you're talking about. That's terrific. Yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of techniques that, you know, we use in coaching to help people do that, that some of them are silly, some of them are serious, but I think it all, like you said, goes back to reframing. It's shifting your perspective enough to see your choice or your challenge or your fear in a a new way. Outstanding. And I imagine the, uh, the silly ones in particular are interesting in a corporate setting. I've been surprised at how receptive people are, especially when it's in a one-on-one session and I close the door and we do some of that silly stuff. I think if it was like a meeting and they had to do it, I I don't know that uh, people would be as willing to sort of go where I see them go in that one-on-one work. Right. Well, Allie, everything you've said has been really interesting and no doubt there is a lot of information that people can learn from you and I, I'm still, still maybe we'll, we'll do another episode and get the snake man on and all, all three hey. of us one day. Um, <laughs> but in, in all seriousness, where can people find you? So I think the easiest and best places to find me is certainly on my blog, which is breaktheframe.com. I'm actually frequently on Twitter and my uh, name there is at Allie Poland. And those are probably the two best places to track me down. Okay. And as I mentioned, all of the books that we spoke of, The Parent's Guide to Leadership and and everything else that uh, we mentioned, or the other book, rather, that you were involved in, both of those will be linked in the show notes as well as in the Daily Helping app. So people will be able to get those things. Well, Allie, it's been a blast having you on. And I wanted to wrap up, as you know, I always ask my guests to give me their biggest helping, their one thing, the most important thing they want people to walk away with. What would that be for you? So my biggest helping advice is that a cornerstone of personal leadership is taking responsibility for your choices. Don't shoot for a busy life with bragging rights. Create a full life that's filled with more than one dimension. And whatever it is you value, whether it's adventure, family, love, travel, don't wait until you retire to honor those values, but to do it now. Don't wait. Awesome. Awesome. I love that. Very, very good. Allie, this was terrific. Thank you so much for coming on. And for each and every one of you that tuned in to listen to Allie Poland, thank you as well. If you like what you heard, go on, tell a friend, subscribe to the show on iTunes, leave us a nice five-star review. That's how other people find the show. And most importantly, go out there and do something nice for somebody else. Even if you don't know who they are, post it on your feeds using the hashtag MyDailyHelping because the happiest people are those that help others. Until next time, everybody.